you know what? I'm going to step away from my career that I've spent a decade more at. I know I'm making more money than most people will probably ever see. And I know my parents don't support me in this. My husband doesn't support me in this. My friends seem a little bit hesitant about it. But deep down, I know this is what I want to do. And damn it, I'm going to take a chance on myself and my ideas. Or else, why am I here on this planet? Hello, and welcome to Seriously Connected. This is a podcast connecting trailblazing women in business in upstate New York. I'm your host taking over this month's episode of the podcast, and my name is Christina O'Donnell. I am the founder of Bright Sighted Media. We produce podcasts. We also create digital marketing content. And for more on that, head to brightsighted.com. But first, let me tell you about this episode because we are bringing on a three-time Emmy Award winning, yes, Emmy Award winning journalist. He also happens to be a TV news anchor at News Channel 13. And we talk about what you need to pitch yourself to be featured in the local media. And so if you're a woman in business and you want to be featured on the news, we talk about exactly how to do it. If you haven't guessed already, my guest in this episode is Steve Kuj. He also is my husband of nine years and we've been together for 17 years, which is like a lifetime ago, it feels like. He is joining me for this episode. And in addition to talking about how to pitch yourself to be featured by the news, we also talk about what it's like to balance family life with professional aspirations. We talk about the sacrifices that not only women in business make in the pursuit of their dreams, but also the sacrifices that he's made in the pursuit of his own dreams. And we go to a place that honestly, I wasn't expecting. It was kind of surreal to have a conversation with my husband about things that we haven't talked about before, but this time it was just recorded. So that kind of took me by surprise and it gets a little bit emotional at points. Lastly, we discuss our careers in TV news together, what it was like to be dating while also working in TV news, one of the most traumatic and hostile workplaces you can work in. We start spilling the tea on the industry, I would say. So um, enjoy this week's episode. But first, before we get into it, I'm going to share my hot take with you. And my hot take is about Halloween candy. Hello, and welcome to Seriously Connected. I am honored to have a local TV news anchor with us here today. Steve Kuj is the newest anchor at News Channel 13, mm -hmm. nightside anchor. He has a young family here in town, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, I hear. I hear you're married to a wonderful woman, uh, that you have three Emmys. You've been a journalist and a TV news reporter in Los Angeles, Phoenix, Arizona, Atlanta, Georgia, New York City, mm -hmm. And you're originally from Minnesota, Stillwater, Minnesota. And we have a Stillwater here in New York. You make it sound so interesting when you say it like that. Well, that <laughs> is the point. So if you are a woman in business and you're watching mm -hmm. this podcast right now, you might be wondering, hey, Steve Kooj is on the Seriously Connected podcast. <laughs> I wonder if he could seriously help me mm -hmm. and my business get on the news. So if someone had a pitch mm -hmm. for you... That is something that everybody comes up to me and asks. They're okay. like, hey, oh, whoa, you're on the news. You do the TV news. That's even cooler. You should do a story on me. And then I'm like, okay, why? And that's when people usually freeze. And they're like, uh, well, why, why not, right? And the biggest thing I say is like, well, what makes you interesting? What makes, if you flipped on TV, what do you want to see? What do you want to hear? Who do you want to exactly hear from? Mm -hmm. Right. So it's always about finding those particular issues, those key points about your business or your event or yourself, whatever you're trying to pitch. What's the most interesting thing? Like if somebody was going to you know, pick up the front page of a newspaper and there's going to be one sentence, a one sentence headline about you, what would it be? If you can figure that out, that's how you can reach out to the media and get them to actually bite on whatever it is you're trying to pitch. We talk to a lot of people from public relations. We get dozens of emails every day from highly respected and highly paid people in PR and marketing. 
And I would say 99 to 95, 95% is being gracious. 99% of the time, we just delete those press releases and emails because it's like, why, why would we do this? Why is this a big deal that you've got a new person, you're, you're representing an author who wrote a new book about a pizzeria or something? Like, I don't relate to that. I don't think my audience would either. What's the connection there that we all need to be making? And if we can't find that connection, then it just goes into the trash yeah, along with the mountain of other press releases we get. It comes down to why does the audience care? Mm -hmm. And I find myself wondering why would the audience care to listen to this episode, this interview of the Seriously Connected podcast? <laughs> you want me to answer that? <laughs> I mean, I think I come from two specific areas for people in business, women in business particularly. I talk to a lot of women, business owners, CEOs, doctors, um, people from all walks of life. And women in particular, one thing I see them struggling with is confidence. It seems like so many women, when all of a sudden they see a camera, they see somebody with a microphone, they get really nervous, and they, they, get to, they, they feel that imposter syndrome, right? Oh, why? Why does anybody want to talk to me? Why is what I'm doing important? And as a journalist, if I'm going to go talk to somebody, I already know why they're important. Then I have to convince them. I'm talking to you because, say, for instance, something big right now where the, the hurricane's going to Florida. And we've been searching for people with local connections down in Florida. You know, and they say, why, why do you want to talk to me? I'm just, you know, one of, you know, two million people out here who are trying to escape this hurricane. Why me? And I say, well, because you've got a particular experience that we want to hear about. You had friends and family here in the upstate New York area that are telling you to evacuate and you want to stay Put? That takes a lot of guts and a lot of bravery. Where does that come from? So you might think that you're just an average ordinary person, but deep down there's something inside each of us that makes us special and unique. Something I find mm -hmm. with almost every woman who is in business is they've experienced something traumatic or difficult in their mm -hmm. life. And that is why they're in business. And yeah. that's why they have the resilience to still be in business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times these are stories that we don't feel comfortable sharing. Yeah. We don't feel comfortable talking about because we're embarrassed or we feel shame or it's reliving mm -hmm. something traumatic that happened to yeah. us. And we don't want to talk about that on the news. Yeah. But often that is the thing that you should talk about yeah. the most. Like that is the thing that mm -hmm. is going to connect you with the audience the most is when you open up and allow yourself to be vulnerable, that is when, mm -hmm. and when you find that story, right? Yeah. Because we really connect through stories. Sure. And when you share that story with the news, and that's what you are really good at helping bring mm -hmm. out of people because- yeah. Sometimes it's really hard for people to tell their story, mm -hmm. but when you work with them or when I work with them being somebody who helps people tell their stories through podcasting, we kind of like coach them through the, like yeah. telling their own stories and it can be really hard. Yeah, it, it's very hard, especially for people who don't know what makes their story interesting. They know that they want to get attention. They want to be successful. They want to grab headlines. But at the end of the day, it's they're not sure how to do that. For instance, a little while ago, I interviewed a woman who was just starting her own new business here locally. She was opening up a new restaurant. And in her mind, her way that she wanted to get the publicity was, oh, I'm coming out with a new sandwich. You got to check this thing out. And I mean, I get that sounds strange, like a new sandwich or a new thing. I get press releases on that, like yo, there's this new restaurant in town, and guess what? They've got a new sandwich. You've got to see it to believe it. And they put this in it, and you're like, as a as a journalist, you're like, okay, cool. But is cool. there pickles in it? Yeah. Like, like, what about chips? All right. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, sure, that might get picked up if it's a special, like, chips and... It's the official chips and pickle sandwich day. Yes! We need to pick the one person. <laughs> like, International Donut Day or whatever. Yes. Like, okay, maybe we'll pick, like, the one person on that one day. But you're really rolling the dice because a lot of donut places or sandwich shops or mm -hmm. whatever. So... I mean, they're thinking very superficial. I go to that restaurant because I'm just looking for a good story to tell. And I see a woman who has started her own new restaurant. And I start digging a little deeper, trying to peel away the layers. Okay, so what makes you interesting? Well, you started this restaurant. You're middle-aged. You've got a, a kid. What were you doing before you wanted to start a restaurant? Oh, you were an engineer. You worked in Silicon Valley. You were making... How many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as a very successful engineer? Why would you want to take a risk to throw all that away to open up a sandwich shop here in this small town? 
It's something you always wanted to do. Okay, that's interesting. Why did you want to do it? Because you loved feeding people. You loved that thing that you got, that feeling inside of you when you cooked for others and you saw what you had made, had made them happy. Okay, that's interesting. What did you sacrifice for this? I mean, were your parents against this? Oh, your parents weren't just against you throwing away this career that you went to a prestigious school for and making all this money to start a new restaurant. Your parents weren't only against this. Your husband, now ex-husband, was against this. You opened up this restaurant and it led to a divorce because your husband didn't believe in you. So here we have a huge story about this woman who really put it all on the line, um, you know, lost some very close relationships, lost her marriage because she wanted to chase what mattered most to her, that feeling that made her complete, a feeling that made her like she was giving back to society. This is what she was put on the earth to do, to feed people. There's a lot of restaurants out there. A lot of people open them for different reasons. But this was hers, and she had sacrificed so very much. Now she's a single mom just trying to, you know, make her dream work. Her one purpose that she was on earth here to do, have a restaurant, to raise her kid, and to be happy. And she's chasing all of that. Again, look how deep we dug and to find all these different layers, all these interesting points of this story that are so much more than just local woman opens up a new sandwich restaurant and oh, by the way, she's got a new sandwich for sale. Check this out. Those are the kinds of things that catch eyes, that get the viewers involved. It's the kind of thing you'd see like in a soap opera. There's reasons why there's all these, you know, deep, weird storylines that come in soap operas and TV shows because it, it finds a way to connect with people. And again, you might not think that your story is special and all, but when it becomes something we can all relate to, a story of, you know, sacrifice, a story of really taking a step out there, being brave, going for what you want to go for, that's very relatable. And I think what makes it especially interesting is that not everybody has the courage to take that step, to say, you know what, I'm going to step away from my career that I've spent a decade more at. I know I'm making more money than most people will probably ever see. And I know my parents don't support me in this. My husband doesn't support me in this. My friends seem a little bit hesitant about it. But deep down, I know this is what I want to do. And damn it, I'm going to take a chance on myself and my ideas. Or else, why am I here on this planet? So this has me wondering, Steve, what goals and dreams are you chasing? What I, have you sacrificed? I've always wanted my own television show. I've always wanted that deep down. I love television. I love the production. I don't need to be a star. I don't need to be famous. I don't like that. But I love telling stories. I love the whole video creation process. And, you know, I moved to Los Angeles. I was there for eight years trying my darndest to get something to work. And the sacrifice there is, you know, trying to make it in television, let alone, you know, television news. It, it's a process. It's a journey. Some people are born into it and, you know, they've got the right parents that are connected to the right people. They're just, they're born on third base, as they say. And it's not easy, not too hard for them to hit a home run. Most of us are, you know, we're right there at home plate, just trying to get up to bat and waiting for our chance. For me, that chance was finding that idea, finding that passion that brought me up to bat. I love television. I love telling stories. I'll try news. Went to college for that. I hit a pretty good, you know, line drive. Was able to make it to first base. That was graduating college with a good resume and getting my first job in Augusta, Georgia. From there, I was able to get on to, to second base, which was moving on up from my first market, Augusta, Georgia, all the way to Atlanta in a little over a year. I was good at what I did because I was passionate about it. And it was showing in my work. I was moving on up. And then it was, you know, trying to get onto third base. Eventually, you know, jumped over to Phoenix, Arizona, caught the eye of a news director in Los Angeles and got over to L.A. OK, I'm in Los Angeles. My station is located in Hollywood. I'm on third base. I'm right here. All I need to do is find the right people, the right connections to get me home so I can get my own TV show. But as I learned that last step to get from third base to home to score is insanely difficult. It's like, uh, I like to say it's a catch-22. In order to get a TV show picked up, you have to make it. And to make it, you need a lot of people. To get all those people, you've got to get a production studio interested in you. To get a production studio interested in you and your ideas, you've got to have an agent, a good agent. To get a good agent interested in you, well, they usually like to see people who are already doing something and are very successful. So how do you get a great agent if you're not already really successful? 
it's it's kind of a slow crawl towards trying to find the right people to talk to and get the right circumstances so you can get that show. And I was able to actually create a show, pitch it to a few different people and a few different agencies, including Amazon, MGM, USA, TNT, the A&E Network, a lot of different networks. And we got really close. I think we went to the second round with A&E for this, this TV show idea I had. And they just passed on it. Just wasn't the right time. So I'm still stuck at third base, waiting for my dream to happen. And all in all, what did that cost me? Well, I'm 38 years old, and I've spent some of my best years away from my friends and family in Minnesota. I avoided trips, traveling the world, things I would have loved to have done, but just didn't because I was so focused on trying to make something of myself. And something else that cost me was, I remember being in Phoenix, Arizona. I was in contention to be a weekend news anchor. I'd never been a news anchor before full time. And I was going to be the weekend news anchor, not just a fill in guy. I was going to, this is going to be my position in Phoenix market 12. I'm like, this is hot 12th biggest city in the country. I'm going to be the weekend anchor. And as I was going back and forth for this position with some other people, my grandmother, my dad's dad got really sick. And I remember she was in the hospital and things were kind of touch and go. We weren't sure, you know, how long she was going to be around for. And I remember saying to my mom, you know, I think I, I think I should come home, you know, to, to see grandma, just to make sure that she's going to be okay in case something happens. And I remember my mom said, you know, we talked about your dad. I mean, we, you really want this, this weekend news anchor position. This is a great opportunity for you. And if you come home on this weekend, you know, you might miss that opportunity to be the weekend anchor. And so I said, oh, okay, well, you know, it's, I guess it'll save me a plane ticket that costs a lot of money and hopefully grandma will be okay. You know, you guys say she's going to be okay and I'll keep on, you know, pushing and trying and performing to make my dream a reality. And in the end, my grandmother passed away like two weekends later. I wasn't there because I was still trying to, you know, get this weekend anchor position and in the end, I didn't even get the position because they went with somebody else entirely who didn't even work at the station. And that's a lesson you learn. Like there are some sacrifices you make and it's not until you get older that you realize which sacrifices are, are worth it. You know, if you are going to take a risk, at which point do you, you know, put your family, your family events and your, the people who matter most ahead of what you're chasing? And sometimes it's hard to figure out. Sometimes, again, like with my grandmother, you know, I, we thought she was going to last a little bit longer than she did, but that, that's not what happened. And instead, I spent that time, you know, where she was in the hospital, slowly dying. I spent that time working for something that, you know, didn't even turn out in the end. Obviously, I kept moving on up, moved to Los Angeles, made it in New York City, and now I'm a full-time news anchor. So, you know, in the end, you know, I was still going to keep rising and keep improving, but at the time, you know, looking back, it's, I feel like there are things I should have done in the past. I wish I could go back and redo if I could do it again. That's sad, Steve. That's life. You don't know what's, what you're going to miss or what you're going to do, which is why I think it's so important, like right now for me to be like present for my kids who are six and four. And I know right now they don't really care. They're more just like, oh, we want to play games. We want to play TV. We want a rough house. We want to do this. And it's hard to like not be there for them all the time, especially as like a night anchor, because, you know, I start my day at 3.30 p.m. And I usually don't get home from work until 12.30 a.m. So, you know, I see my kids in the morning. I see them off to school. And then I really don't see them again in person until the next morning. So that's, that's it. I mean, and we got FaceTime calls, but you know, when you call a kid on a phone, how interested are they in talking to you? Most of the time it's like, oh, hey dad. Yeah. Guess what? I'm hungry. Mom, give me some food. I do this. Da, da, da. And they, they just, they're not, it's not the same as when you're there in person. So, you know, driving home, driving 35 minutes while I have a break to get home, spend maybe 30 minutes or an hour with the kids, and then drive 35 minutes back to work while I have breaks is important. It's, it's hard, and it makes my life more difficult, but it's, it's worth it, even for those, you know, those little moments, the little bit of time I do get to spend. My hot take is that if you are one of those families that gives out a toothbrush and toothpaste every Halloween, thank you. I 
appreciate it. Why? Because my kids will eat so much candy that they need that toothbrush and toothpaste. They also like really go at it with the toothbrush. They chew on their toothbrushes. So we are always always in need of more toothbrushes. So if you are one of those fa- families, thank you. Keep it up. But if you are one of those families who hands out crackers or cookies or those like peanut candies that are really chewy that nobody likes, stop it. They're gross. Don't do it anymore. We don't want those candies and we don't want crackers. We want candy. And if you are looking to give away a healthy candy, I researched this because USA Today just posted an article about what the healthiest candy you can give away during Halloween is. Do you have any guesses? It's peanut M&M's. Peanut M&M's is the healthiest candy you can give away for Halloween. But I'm more of like a Sour Patch Kids, Skittles, Starburst. Starburst jelly beans are the best. But that's not really a Halloween candy. Let me share some stats with you. Okay, so this is from Rose Britt. She is a registered dietitian with Top Nutrition Coaching. And she says, if you want to provide a little bit more than just corn syrup to trick-or-treaters, peanut M&M's contains a little less than one gram of fiber, two grams of protein, and nine grams of sugar. It says here that Smarties are the healthiest sugary sweet that you can offer. Nobody likes Smarties. If you like Smarties, raise your hand. Nobody here is raising their hands. And I bet you there are not raising your hand because Smarties are like toothpaste kind of. They're just like dry. They're not enjoyable. Who likes, do you like, who likes Smarties? Like sweet tarts are a lot like Smarties, but they taste better. Smarties are gross. I don't like them. Okay. It says here that um, in general, candy provides little to no nutritional value. The CDC's dietary guidelines for children and, uh, oh, excuse me, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that children over two limit their daily added sugar intake to less than 25 grams, which is going to be pretty hard through Halloween, like, let's just be honest with ourselves. This dietitian recommends allowing your children to splurge on Halloween because that can help them create a healthier relationship with food because having them count grams of sugar or calories or anything might mess with their heads. So I just don't worry about it on Halloween. And, you know, balance is the spice of life. I truly believe that. And there will be people out there who give away toothbrushes. And that also just makes me feel good as a parent. Will you come to my house for Halloween and get a toothbrush? No. My husband has already bought all of the candy that we are going to be giving away. There is a lot of all the things with a lot of corn syrup in there. I don't believe we have any um, peanut M&Ms. But now you know that if your kids are going to be eating peanut M&Ms, it's the healthiest candy. That is my hot take. Thank you to the toothbrush people out there. I appreciate you. That and I do think working in news fulfills you, Mm -hmm. right? Like I think in part it is your dream. And so it's important for you to do that. Are you Mm -hmm. looking at your Baba up there? Yes. Yeah. Sure. (laughs) I just (laughs) saw you glance up. (laughs) No, it is important. Do you think about her often? I do. I do. I wonder if they'd be proud of me. I remember, but it wasn't just my Baba, which is Ukrainian for for grandmother. It's babushka. I think about all my grandparents. I remember like even my my grandfather, one of the last, my my mom's dad. One of the last talks I had with him was, you know, oh, guess what? I've, you know, I'm pitching this new TV show and, you know, hopefully in a couple of months, this will be the new big thing. And, you know, you'll be so proud of me when you see this. And uh, how exciting will that be? I'm here in Los Angeles. You're in Minnesota. You'll be able to flip on the TV and see me doing the show. And it didn't become anything again. And, you know, you it's it's exciting to talk about and to, you know, think like, oh, this would be great if I could make this a reality. But it's not always meant to be. Or if it is meant to be, you don't know how long it's going to take. And right now I'm still on that. I don't know how long it's going to take or if it will ever happen. And I think that's a tough thing to come to grips with, you know, when you are chasing some kind of dream That seems incredibly difficult to grasp. And then you start to wonder, okay, at what point do I give up? You know, what point do I 
switch gears and try something else. I think that's something that everybody who wants to be a professional athlete or an Olympian, baseball player, gymnast, NFL hockey, soccer, whatever it might be, eventually you reach an age where it's like, okay, well, I can't do this anymore because, you know, I'm just not as fast or as strong as I used to be. What else am I going to do? You know, if I'm not going to be this amazing athlete, what's my next you know, thing in life? With wanting to have my own TV show as a host, it's, you know, you can be a host at pretty much any age, but how long are you going to try to, am I going to try to pursue that when I might be putting other things off? like pursuing news, working for a network, being a correspondent. Maybe that's an international correspondent. Maybe that's, you know, a network anchor someplace. Um, but it's do, you, tough. do you feel like you have your own show now that you're the anchor of a news program? No. At multiple different. It doesn't. It's even though slots? like I'm on the show when I'm, you know, the main person in front of the camera talking. It's not my show because it's it's put together by a bunch of other people and it's a news program. Even though I write parts of it, there's lots of news programs all around. I think mine is special because I add a little more personality and, you know, fun into it and try to find a way to tell these somewhat everyday boring stories in a way that's interesting to people to get their attention, to make them see that news is important, but in the end, you know, I don't doesn't feel like my thing. Especially because, you know, my thing, this local television news program, you know, really can't easily be watched by my friends and family in Minnesota or in California. Have they not downloaded the app? Oh my gosh, if they could just download the they app. They can. Right, exactly. They can download, you can put it on Roku. And they're almost 70 years old and they're not going to figure that out. <laughs> they can figure it out. Maybe. They'd probably have to my call me and walk it. them through it. Yeah. He's. He's you good. know, he's about the same age mm -hmm. as your parents. Yeah. Yeah, he can figure they can figure mm -hmm. it out. Sure, watch you on the app. Yeah. You're like, but no, they want to watch the news that they can use for their I think there's something also about competing, you know, like in my mind, I'd love to be in competition with the other big players mm -hmm. in the television world. I want I don't want to go to local or regional Emmy contests. I want to go to the national contests where it's my show up there against Nor O'Donnell or like the guys over with, with some new like Disney plus show that's really popped off. You know, I want my show to be up there against everybody else's competing for some sort of, you know, relevancy on a national or worldwide stage. That's what I would like to do. How do you make that dream happen? You know, if I knew how to do that, I wouldn't be right here talking to you. <laughs> yes, you would. <laughs> Maybe I still would. Yes, you would. Um, well, so I just, I think that this is something that's very different about our personalities, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, I had a dream of starting my own business. Well, actually, it wasn't a dream. I didn't really want to. I just was sick and tired of the situations that I was in, and I kind of felt like I had to do it. I feel like if you have a dream, you just make, like, you figure out, like, what's the path to make it a reality, and then you start following that path. At least that's how I operate. Mm -hmm. But I think that, like, to me, that means, like, figuring out how to do it on my own. Yeah. And, and for you, it's kind of like waiting for someone to mm -hmm. find you or see yeah. you. So if that's, like, what you're looking to do, then how do we get you in front of those people's eyeballs more? Mm -hmm. Again, that's kind of the, the whole catch-22 is, like, you need these really good connected people in your life. What's your show going to be about? Oh, I can't tell you right here. It's a secret. What's it about? Is it fight or flight? Is it about fighting? Or fleeing, if you're in a situation where all of a sudden there's a fight in the alley next to you, what do you do? Do you get involved or do you run away? What if they have a hammer? Or an axe. What Do you use your chair in self-defense? How do you do that? Is there a way? See, she knows because she's seen my pilot episode that I've been pitching to all these networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that is the show. That is my thing that I thought was interesting. You know, it's um, now more than ever, we see uh, like reality TV or real situations unfolding from parts around the world. People capturing things on their cell phones, things getting picked up by security cameras. And I thought, how can I use my talents of A, being a great storyteller and journalist and B, being very experienced with mixed martial arts, how can I combine those two passions of mine into a TV show? And for me, it was, you know, analyzing real life fights that happen in public and teaching people how to be safe 
if something like that breaks out around your friends, you or loved ones, whether that's in a bar or in a parking lot or in a shopping mall, if something dangerous breaks out, if somebody, you know, who knows what happens, how are you going to react and what can you do better? So that's my show and teaching people how to succeed from that. And my next step that I'm trying to take with that, again, is get it to a television network that wants to produce it and get it on the airwaves. And to get in front of those people, you've got to have people connected to the people who are the gatekeepers. And those are the agents. You need a good agent. And to get a good agent, again, you've got to have you know something about you that catches their eye. And I've got a bunch of agents, but I don't have any with like the major agencies like the Creative Artists Agency or Willie Morris Endeavor. Yeah. What, ca- what catches, what, what's your thing? That's the thing. I need a thing. Right what's now I'm thing? just a pretty face with a good voice and some great <laughs> ideas. And that's all I have. That's all you, that's all you got. I really do think face. that, you know, there was a time in television yeah. before the internet. You do know karate. Yes, I do. But for instance, like Wheel of Fortune, Pat Sajak, you know, um, Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe. Do you know these people just worked in the TV news business before they really took off and got big? They just went to regular auditions because they were good on TV. And freaking social media and they, came in and effed it up. I know. And now freaking social media. And now you've got Ryan Seacrest out here taking every <laughs> single hosting <laughs> opportunity. And the ones that he's not taking, Steve Harvey is out there gobbling up. They're good at what they do, but it's like, could you leave some scraps for us? Anyway, there was a time when just all it took was like, you know, hey, you're somebody with a good voice and an interesting personality. Let's give you a shot at Jeopardy. Could you be the host for that? I don't know. So I, I think some, maybe I was born a decade too late. Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. Or a decade too soon. Yeah, never know. Shoot. I oh. do think about that being born too soon because I was, right when YouTube was starting to take off, I was like maybe a senior in college when YouTube was starting to get noticed. And had I been a little bit younger at the time, not in college, I would have jumped on it quicker. Because in college, I didn't, I wasn't taking YouTube seriously at all when I should have been and starting my own thing to get recognized before it, everybody had their own YouTube channel. Yeah. So yeah, born a decade too soon and a decade too late for a number of reasons. Why am I here right now? What am I going to do? Well, what is next for you? World domination. I don't like that. No. What's really next for you? Supporting my family, my kids, and my wife. Aww. I don't know if you're being serious. but That is what I'm doing. What's next for me? That's the thing. It feels like a waiting game sometimes. I'm trying to pitch my television show to become the next big hit, but it feels like a lot of networks are kind of like in this wait and see mentality before the election takes place. Yeah. And after that's all over, I think people will settle into, okay, what do we want to do now? Just got to wait for that to happen. But again, it's you don't want to wait. You want to get out there and grab life by the reins Aww. and make something of yourself and, you know, be proactive. But eventually there's only so much, you know, action you can take before, you know, you're sending out emails and text messages and phone calls and not hearing anything back. And you don't want to be annoying by repetitively asking people who you've already, you know, reached out to. You don't want to be that person and burn any bridges accidentally. So you kind of just stuck waiting for a little bit. What has it been like working with your wife? Which wife? That's a very great point. Like, <laughs> you get the good one or the bad one today? I don't know. <laughs> what has it been like working like, with my so, lovely, fantastic uh, wife? So we've known each other mm-hmm. since college. Um, we like started dating like almost immediately after meeting, like within a week, right? Yeah. Was it a week or two weeks? I don't know. It's about it. You played hard to get for a long time, though. Well, yeah. (laughs) Um, I'm still playing. (laughs) I see. Um, um, But I just, what is it, what has it been like? Because we have traveled the country Mm -hmm. working together and we are two ambitious people. Mm -hmm. And what is that like for you? I mean, I know what it's like for me and it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to balance like being in a relationship with someone who is just as ambitious as you, but like you love them. So Mm -hmm. you want to cherish their dreams and you want to help them succeed, but you also want them to be in your life. You don't want them to resent you. You don't want to resent them. How do you do that? A great analogy I would guess would be every plane has a pilot and a co-pilot, but only one person can be piloting the plane 
at a time. As your co-pilot, I'm just trying to do whatever I can to make sure you fly this thing straight and take off as high as you can go and pick up maybe a few passengers along the way. Like what? Like customers and clients. <laughs> okay. On this business plane of yours as we try to go higher and higher with it. I just try to do my best to lend my talents to you, to support you and raise you up as best I can. Because I know, you know, if you succeed, it just makes things easier on everybody else. My dream is is different. And again, because there is so much of like a you know, work really hard, put something out there and then wait, 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 wait. It feels like there's seasons for my dream, whereas yours is constant. And, you know, there's not always something you can do to necessarily help me, but I feel like there's a lot of things I can always be doing to help you. I don't know. I think we need a show, a mm. podcast, YouTube channel for Steve Kouche. It's difficult when uh, we both have ideas that we like and we, you know, want to pursue and, you know, creative minds that don't always think on the exact same page. So I think that can be tough sometimes because sometimes the co-pilot wants to, you know, take over the flight stick, but you're like, no, that's mine. <laughs> Back off. Stay in your seat, co-pilot. But that's how it is. It is how it is. <laughs> I it's. Really know what to say. I didn't know I was going to be piloting the plane. Well, at some point, I'd like yeah. to jump out in my parachute and then <laughs> commandeer a different plane and then take off in that. <laughs> what is that metaphor? What does that mean? I'll have a parachute. It'll be okay. I don't know if I want you to jump ship, man. Who's driving, flying I'll always. Plane? Be, I'll just move back into coach and relax. I meant first class. We'll say first class where I can relax and put on a movie. Oh, wow. I don't even know. I don't, I don't, I don't exactly know how this analogy yeah, is going either. I don't either, know but, how it's working. I don't know if I like it. But it's. I say that because eventually you won't need me as much. You'll be able to fly it all by yourself. Because with any person trying to get, again, a business off the ground, a.k.a. a plane off the ground, okay. it takes a team of people to make that happen. Got it. I mean, and we could take it further. Like, you know, who did we have initially just fueling up your plane? Where do those people come from? You know, those are our parents maybe, you know, instilling the values in us, our teachers, our professors that, you know, showed us how to reach for the stars. And so you want, look like you want to throw up as I'm talking about this. Anyway, so here we are rising up higher and higher, gaining altitude with your business plane. And I'm sitting there right alongside you trying to do my best to help you get, get to where you want to go. Thank you, Steve. And once you, again, once you, you level off in your business plane and everything seems to be going smooth and you look like you're ready to buy a whole new fleet of planes and do all sorts of international oh flights, God. then I can get in another plane. I was thinking we were going to go someplace else. But <laughs> Where did you want to go? I don't know. I, I thought maybe we were going to go back to Augusta when we first started working together and you were my boss. Yeah. And like that was the beginning of us really like working together. Yeah. It's hard. It was um, hard because I feel like I'm somebody who can. You're a boss for a reason. You like to be in charge. You're a leader. You like I to lead. I don't know if I like to be in charge, but I just. Well, I, I feel just like am. you're not. <laughs> You might not be comfortable if you're not in charge sometimes. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, because it's you've got this vision in your head, and you want to, you know, you want to follow that path. And other people coming in, even if it's me, you know, we don't have your exact same vision. We might have different ideas or paths to get there, but they might not coalesce with your vision. Um, so that was kind of a, a lesson I had to learn. You know, sometimes I needed to be quiet and just listen to what you had to say instead of kind of inserting my own ideas. Well, when we worked in Augusta, Georgia together, mm -hmm. so Steve and I were both working journalists in TV news. And I mean, the stories we would cover were crazy. Sometimes. Yes, yeah. really crazy. Like, do you remember the story that you covered? I think it was your first story that went national. Mm -hmm. it was, was it the albino man yeah. who was chopped up Yeah. in his coffin? Yeah. Yeah. There was a, a six foot eight al albino man whose family had him buried and the day of the funeral, they realized the extra large casket they had purchased for him didn't seem so extra large after all. So a month later, when the coroner dug him up, they discovered that the funeral home had sold them. They, they paid for an extra large casket, but the funeral home gave them a much cheaper, normal size casket. But in order to squeeze an eight foot, uh, six foot eight tall man in there, they had to cut off his legs and put them in the casket next to him so he could fit in one piece. Well, multiple pieces, actually. Anyway, it's a crazy story. It's wild. You know, at the end of the day, that affects us differently. I would hear that. I'm like, that's horrible. I can't wait to tell this story. There were stories that you were on, and it was like, this is horrible. This is 
absolutely heartbreaking. I can't help but feel for the family and the children that are left behind now, and it takes an emotional toll on you. So we were affected differently by these these stories. And, you know, in my mind, I was just trying to help you get through that. And sometimes I thought, maybe this isn't right for you if you can't, you know, compartmentalize this emotional side with your personal side. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're talking about this, this father who was killed in a car accident. Tomorrow you're going to have another story you're going to have to do. Yeah. And you can't come back to work with yesterday's story still weighing on your heart. Yeah. I think that is, was like the most difficult thing for me. Mm -hmm. And it's still difficult for me today, but at least now we spend more than two minutes on a story and yeah. it's like not onto the next story. It's like, Oh, we we're sticking mm -hmm. with this story for like a year. Yeah. And that feels better. Mm -hmm. Does yeah. it justice? Yeah. It feels like it does it justice. And I don't have mm -hmm. to just like open up with someone and mm -hmm. leave them. That feels sad. So we hear the confusing story about what's next for me. What's next for Christine O'Donnell and Bright Sighted? Well, currently, I'm taking over the Seriously Connected podcast for mm -hmm. the month of October, which means Halloween is coming. This is the third of four episodes. Mm -hmm. And my goal is, of course, to speak to women in business and let them know that this is a podcast that they can come to share their stories and bring in people they can interview so they can let people know more about their business. Mm -hmm. um, you're somebody who works for Bright Sighted as well as WNYT. Is there anything that you would want people to know about the Bright Sighted business that we haven't talked about? I think what Brightsided does great is working with clients and people on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis and helping them figure out what makes them special because everyone is special and unique deep down at some level. And it's just finding that, digging it out and being able to tell those stories to connect with the much larger, larger, broader audience. Is there anything else that I should be saying? What's my story? What's my headline? Help me. It's so well. So this is like so very much yeah. a part of it, right? Like, so you and I mm -hmm. do this for other people all of the time. Yeah. And it's so easy for me to do it with other people. Yeah. But when it comes to like doing it for myself, I get like von Dugald. Mm -hmm. Don't know if that's a word, but nope. you know we'll go with it. I think your story is all about how you used to go from telling short stories one at a time, day by day. And you know, just <laughs> of the worst days yeah, of people's life and moving on to the next thing, just like that. And now you're focused on telling much broader stories. But it's not just that you have control over it now. As before, you were working in a business where you had no control and things were messy. They were unethical. You didn't like it, but you still found good people and you wanted to tell their stories and you wanted to do it in a way that was ethical in a way that could shed light on important issues. And you're doing that now. And that's what matters. So you're saying the news business one was unethical? Was unethical? <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> Us local stations are pretty good. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some... So, do you, so I, you know that I've been wanting to start this podcast, Tales and TV News. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's a risk? Like part of me, part of the thing that's like stops me is like, is this too much of a risk to share some of the, like the behind? The oh no, no. I think people want to hear that. Yeah. I Which story should I start with? Oh my gosh. It could be next episode. Which of all the stories of my life and news would we share? The one that I think about that I love the most is um, the high speed chase in Los Angeles when you were anchoring on Fox LA and you were describing what was happening as these um, pursuit suspects cut off a TMZ like tour bus in the heart of Hollywood and started like throwing money or stuff at them. Bread. Bread started throwing Th bread at throwing them. Throwing good bread. It was a <laughs> it was weird. It was really random. I don't know. But yeah. I feel like there's all these reporters around here that everyone's got a really crazy story to tell. Here I thought you were gonna say the one about like the time I didn't come home for like a whole night because I was like trying to get a story out of a detective. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> that was like a my were we married at that point? Yeah. My wife disappeared, went on a date <laughs> with a detective. It's not a date. I'm just going out to meet a guy for drinks. Okay, not a date. Oh, what time is it now? It's two in the morning. Christine's still not here. Where could she be? My phone was dead. Oh, her phone is dead. What a coincidence. I was with a, a detective. A detective. And, and I got drunk. 
And my phone. So, side note, in the news <laughs> business, a lot of news reporters end up in inappropriate relationships with members of the law enforcement. Anyway, what was I supposed to do? I couldn't <laughs> drive. I couldn't drive with the... Yes. With that's, the... That's, I'm sure he would have written you a ticket right there. That's how they get you in their relationships. Mm-hmm. You're too drunk to drive. Better stay with me, lady. I'll write you He's a the... ticket if you leave. Get on the back of my motorcycle. We're going mm. to IHOP. Well, Christine, I love sharing stories with you. And I know we've got a whole lot more that we could tell in the future, I'm sure. Um, Thank you very much, Steve, for being on the show. I miss doing this. Mm -hmm. I miss talking with you. Yeah. Yeah, this is kind of fun. Yeah. It is nice when we're not at home surrounded by kids who are like, I need food. My tummy hurts. And you can hear me just yelling. food snacks. (laughs) (laughs) Food is snacks. Pick up your clothes. Put your pants back on. Get your finger out of your nose. It's a lot of that. Anyway. Hey, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation with Steve and I. I really like him and I hope you liked him too. And if you have feedback for us, be sure to connect with us on Instagram. You can send us a DM. We are at Seriously Connected Pod and uh, we look forward to hearing your feedback. And don't forget to share this podcast with someone you think needs to hear it. <laughs>